I want to look at verse 12 through 14, and then we'll flip over to chapter 7, and read verses 1 through 3. When you have it, say amen. Second Chronicles, the Old Testament. Amen. Second Chronicles. As we continue in this time of sharing in our 43rd church anniversary, Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 12. Hear the words of our God. And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel. And spread forth his hands, for Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long, five cubits broad, and three cubits high, and had set it in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel, and spread forth his hands towards heaven, and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven, nor in the earth which keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. I want to talk from this subject this morning, the blessing of the gathering place. The blessing of the gathering place place. It is Vance Havner who writes that churches start at 11 o'clock sharp and end at 1 o'clock dull. Reason why he says that is because many individuals do not understand the importance of congregational worship. They do not understand the importance of the church and why we gather. Many of us gather out of parental constraints while some of us gather out of tradition. But those of us who understand the authenticity of real worship and understand the importance of congregational praise and understand the importance of being in the house of worship understand that this is not just an ordinary place. But this is the place that you and I come so that we might be able to commune with God. This gathering place is the place where we meet God. This gathering place is a place where we dedicate and commit ourselves to praise and worship and service of God. When we come to this gathering place, we are reminded of the power of God. We are reminded of how God moves in and throughout the lives of his people. When we come to this place, you may show up downtrodden or feel as though you've been disdained by life and been beaten by life. But it's something about sitting on the road with someone who knows the power of God. Something about sitting on the road with someone who lifts up their hands and praise God. It's something about sitting on the road with someone who has had an encounter with God. It's something special about the gathering place. There's no other place in our lives where you and I can come and lay our burdens at the altar of the Lord. There's no other place where you and I can come and hear the praises of the saints. There's something authentic and wonderful and majestic about being or having the ability to enter in to the house of worship. It's no wonder the psalmist is heard by saying these words, that it's something about entering into God's place of worship that we ought to lift up our hands and give him praise. And so it is as we look at this particular passage of scripture, the Bible teaches us that David now, who has now been the king of Israel, he has now made his throne and he wants to do something great for God because it's God that has led him. It's God who has now made him the king of Israel. The Bible teaches in 1 Chronicles that David could not build the temple unto God because David had blood on his hands. 
David was a man of war, and God would not allow anyone to build his temple who had spilled blood. But God kept his promise to David and allows his son Solomon to build what David had once started. Solomon now builds this temple unto God. It is a magnificent temple where the people of God may come and worship and give God praise. As Solomon builds this temple before the people of God enter in, Solomon takes time to fall on his knees and begins to open up with this dedication prayer unto God. Because Solomon understood that if we are going to gather in this place, that this place must be a house of prayer. Solomon now begins to pray and pray unto God. And he teaches us in verse number 12 through 14 that this is a place where prayer must be conducted. Watch the movement of Solomon in verses 12 through 14 as we see the humility of Solomon. As we see as Solomon now dedicates the temple unto God. It would be inappropriate for him to go into the temple because he was not a temple priest. Solomon does not take the authority of being the king of Israel and go into the place or the temple of God. Because he understands that any one of us who comes into the house of worship, that we must remember that we must come with humility and long-suffering. Solomon does not enter into the temple with arrogance. He does not enter into the temple as though he belongs. But rather Solomon comes to this place and knowledge in his life that if God allows you to make it to the house of worship, it has nothing to do with what you did and everything to do with what God has done. Solomon now, he kneels and spreads out his hands before God. And Solomon recognized that you should go before God and a posture of surrender, a posture of openness, a posture of reception, because Solomon understands that the reason why many of us don't get what we need when we come to the house of worship is that we show up with a sense of arrogance. We show up with a sense as though God owes us something. But those of us who understand the gathering place, we understand that if God wakes you up one more morning and allows you an opportunity to be in the house of worship, that that is reason enough to come in with a sense of humility. As we look at the movement of Solomon, we look at verses 20 through 21, and he reminds us that this gathering place is a place of cares. Not only is it a place of humility, but Solomon says that it is a place of cares. Solomon prays and asks the Lord to hear the supplication of God's people. You must understand that they had been through a whole lot of struggle. They had been from war to war. They had seen their ancestors in Egypt land who had dealt with the suffering under the hands of Pharaoh. They had dealt with being wanderers in the wilderness of God. And now when they come to this place of excellence, this place of prosperity, this place of blessing, he simply says to them that the gathering place ought to be a place of cares. He desires that the Lord's house be a place where you and I can bring the cares and the burdens of life, that we may lay them down at the feet of God. And may I remind you that the church is still the best place that you and I might bring our burdens unto the Lord. He reminds us that whatever burden that you're dealing with, whatever challenge that you and I have, that the greatest place that you and I have is being able to come into the gathering place and lay our burdens at the feet of God. And what I like about God and Solomon, and he writes to us, that there's an extension of the gathering place that does not just end at these four walls, but rather you and I have been given the right and the authority now that we don't just have to show up at this place and pray, but we have the authority to pray wherever we are. And that means that this gathering place is not only an extension of 4315 West Fuquay, but it is an extension of your house. It is an extension of your cubicle. It is an extension of you riding in the car, which means that when I show up to this place, I understand that I've already had a, a worship with God. I've already entered into this time of praise unto the Lord. 
And brothers and sisters, we must understand that this is the place where you can bring your cares to. And one of the challenges of the church in the 21st century that we live in, the reality is that many people do not bring their burdens to the church because they are afraid of what people might say. And might I suggest to you that the sad reality of the church and the condition of the church is that we have so many people that are in church but have no church in them. The reality is that when people come to church and bring their burdens to church, it is not for you to point the finger at them. It is not for you to discredit their problems and their issues, but rather when we bring our cares and our burdens to the church, it is when the church ought to get down on their knees and pray for one another. It is when the church ought to be able to lock arms with individuals and say, I may not have been through what you're going through, but I know that God can bring you out. And there ought to be some folk in here that can testify to some neighbor on the road that whatever you brought to the Lord today, I'm a living witness that God can deliver you out of your problems. And there ought to be some folk in here that can testify and glad about it that God can bring you out of your storm. So here it is. He not only shows us that the gathering place ought to be a place of care, but the gathering place in verses 22 to 23 is also a place of conflict. Watch this, Solomon says that when there's trouble between two people or parties, that the place to settle, it is in the presence of the Lord. And I wanna suggest that brothers and sisters, when we have conflict among believers, when we have challenges among believers, the best place for you to settle it is in the presence of God. Because when we go before the presence of God, there's no hiding place for you and I. When we go before the presence of God, we have the right to be able to see ourselves in the reflection of God. And here's the reality, as long as we bring our burdens to the streets, we'll never be able to see how wrong we really are. But when we come to the house of worship, and we see God and see ourselves for who we really are. I don't have time to point the finger at what you did, but I gotta deal with what I did. And so when we come to the house of worship, it ought to be a place where we bring our conflicts and our troubles to. But not only that, in verse number 24 and 25, it is a place of casualties. Solomon calls upon the Lord to hear the cry of this battle-weary believer. You must understand that they had warred Israel with so many nations. They had fought the Philistines. They had fought over and over again. And they had dealt with the battles that life brings as a believer of God. And whether we understand it all or not, we are all engaged in a brutal conflict with life. Life can be brutal. Life can be hard. Life can be strange. Life can catch you off guard. And if you're not careful, life will beat you up. And the truth of the matter is, is that when life beats you up, the greatest blessing that you and I have is being able to bring our casualties unto God. And so it is, as this writer writes for you and I, is that often we find ourselves engaged in intense spiritual warfare. Sometimes while in these battles, these are those who get wounded by the enemy. And I like that because the psalmist in Psalm 147 says that when we are wounded by life, that we can bring our cares upon the Lord. It is 1 Peter chapter 5 that helps you and I to appreciate that even when we have cares of this world, that the Bible says that we can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And so it is, believers of God, we must all understand that all of us have been scarred by life. All of us have had to deal with death in life. All of us have had to deal with betrayal in life. And the great blessing is that when I show up to this gathering place, that this gathering place has a way of taking the brokenness that life brings me and putting me back together again. And there ought to be some folk in here that can testify that all week long you've dealt with the casualties of life and you look forward to coming to the gathering place. 
because it's something about when the saints of God get together. Something about when you rub shoulders with somebody who's been through some heartache and pain. There's something about when you rub shoulders with somebody who don't know how to keep quiet because they got the I can't help it. And when you come to church and give God praise, it has a way of making us think about bringing our casualties unto God. But brothers and sisters, not only does Solomon help us to understand that, but he gives us a second thing in this text, and that is through verses 32 and 42, he shows us that it is a place that encourages the pardon of all people. As Solomon writes, he wants us to understand that this is the place of the wandering stranger. It is the idea of understanding that even people who weren't part of God's covenant with Israel still had a right to come to the temple. It is a reminder to us that we must not put our noses up at folk that don't know God like we know God. It is a reminder to us that none of us have always been saved. It, it is a reminder to us that none of us are perfect. It, it is a reminder to us that all of us are X something. It, it is a reminder to us that we're all just one slip away. It, it is a reminder to us that the right amount of pressure will cause you to slip backwards if you're not careful. And for those of you Bible-toting believers that believe that you can't slip and mess up, it is a reminder that all of us have have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so it is a reminder that every stranger that has a right and an opportunity to enter in to the house of worship. And I want to suggest that the sad truth of church today and people today is that we have become so exclusive in church. We have a tendency now that we are so mean and arrogant and, and, and have such disdain for people in the world that folk don't feel comfortable coming to church because those of us who were saved forgot how we got saved. And we have this mindset that now that I am saved, that I don't deal with that anymore. But what if God dealt with us the way we deal with other folk? What if God treated us like we treat other people? What if God turned his back on us like we turn our back on folk? The church ought to be a place for the stranger. But not only that, believers of God helps us understand that verse number 34 through 35, that this is also the place for the warring saint. This idea is in ancient times, the temple was a rallying point for the army of Israel. It was when they would come together on one accord. They would show up to the temple of God and they would pray over the soldiers who were getting ready to go out into battle. The idea here is that it was a God of the temple that the soldiers looked when they went into battle. In other words, they understood that going out into life is a battle. And they understood that before they can take on life, they understood that they must go and have a talk with Jesus. And I want to suggest, believers of God, brothers and sisters, that when you face life tomorrow, you better face life knowing that you've gone before God. Because if you don't go before God, the old you will come out and there'll be some things that you say to deal with life. There'll be some activity that you have to deal with life. And the truth of the matter is the church is what keeps me calm. And it is the gathering place that keeps me from going off. It, it is the gathering place that keeps me from showing the old me when stuff comes up in my life. And here it is. When that person cuts you off on Monday morning on the way to work because you've been at the gathering place, they ought to be a different response. When they say something negative to you at your cubicle at work tomorrow because you've been at the gathering place, your response ought not be the same. Because you've been at the gathering place, whatever arguments you've had at home, you ought to go home today and fix those arguments because you've been at the gathering place. So Solomon helps us to understand verse number 36, verse number 39 that it is also the place for the wayward saint. Let the church say wayward saint. wayward 
Solomon asked the Lord to incline his ear unto him. Verse 36 through 39. Here's the idea here. It is the idea of the prayer of the repentant person. The idea here is that he says is the same thing in Psalm 40 when David says, I waited patiently upon the Lord and he inclined his ear unto me and he heard me. The idea here is that of a father who stands and the child tugs on his coat jacket and because there's distance between the child and the father, father leans down as close as he can because he wants to make sure he hears every word that comes out of the child's mouth. And what Solomon says to the wayward believer, those of us who have been in Christ and have messed up with God, he says that when you have a repentant spirit and you can pull on the coattail of God and God will incline his ear unto you. In other words, God will lean down and hear you where you are. And I don't know about you, but that's a great blessing of every believer today to know that God hears me. It is the idea of knowing that wherever I am, that God can hear me. It is the idea of knowing whenever I call him, he can hear me. Which means that the gathering place ought to be a place where the wayward sinner calls on the name of the Lord. It ought to be the place where the wayward sinner knows that God can hear you. And brothers and sisters, it is the idea of understanding that all of us have been the prodigal Christian at some time in our lives. Solomon reminds the people of God that they had been wayward towards God. And he reminds them that this temple is a reminder that ever, no matter how wayward I am, that God always gives me a way to get back to him. One of the ways that we get back to God is learning how to pray to God. It's learning how to call on the name of the Lord. It reminds me, brothers and sisters, of a story of a couple, uh, some 15 years of marriage had began having disagreements. They wanted to make their marriage work and agreed on an idea that the wife had. And this wife decided that for one month, they planned to drop a slip in the fault box. And the boxes would provide a place to let the other know of the daily irritations that the other one had caused in their life. And this wife was diligent in documenting all of the faults of her husband. She wrote down leaving the jelly top off the jar. She wrote down wet towels on the shower floor. She wrote down dirty socks not in the hamper and on and on until the end of the month. And after dinner, at the end of the month, they sat down at the table and exchanged boxes. And husband took the wife's box and the wife took husband's box. And the wife opened up her box and began to start reading. And when she wrote, they were all the same thing. Every slip had on it, Reverend Murphy, pardoned for your mistake. And brothers and sisters, every time we show up to church, we are pardoned because of our mistakes. And there ought to be some folk in here that are mighty excited today because you know when you show up to the house of worship that we are pardoned for our mistakes. And some of you can't get excited about that because you think you make no mistakes. But this is for the folk this morning that can testify that you thank God that you've been pardoned for your mistakes. And so, brothers and sisters, helps us to understand that the wayward saint has been pardoned by God. But, brothers and sisters, he gives us a third one here, found in verse number one and two of chapter seven. That is, it is a place that perpetuates the power of God. In other words, the Bible says that when Solomon finished praying, the Bible says that fire from heaven fell into this place and consumed the sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, this was a demonstration of divine power in the presence of his people. In other words, God wanted to show his people that he had not some power, but he had all power. Wanted to show his people that prayer invokes God's presence. It is the idea of knowing that when we call on God, that it invokes the power of God. It is the idea of knowing that when my finances can't get me out of it, 
when my networking can't get me out of it, when my friends can't get me out of it, prayer still works. It is the idea of knowing that I can call down all of God's power just by falling on my knees and just having a little talk with Jesus and telling him all of my struggles. And the Bible says that when we call on the name of the Lord and when we call on the name of the Lord right, that he will give us his power. And it's not just some power, but he gives us all of his power. And there ought to be some folk in here that are excited about knowing that you can tap into real power. I'm not talking about power of finances. I'm not talking about power of networking, but I'm talking about the power of prayer because prayer is showing up power. And somebody here today that ain't have a dime in your pocket and don't have the right job or don't live in a gated community, you are still on the same page with somebody who can call on that name. Because the Bible says when you call on that name, that demons got to leave you alone. That when you call on that name, that your enemy got to leave you alone. Because there's something about calling on that name. Is there anybody here knows that name? He's a wonder worker. He's my strong tower. He's my fence above every other fence. He's a keeper in the midnight hour. Do you know that name? Do you know that he's Mary's baby? Do you know that he's a bright and morning star? Do you know that name? Well, if you know that name, why don't you help me call that name? Well, if you know that name, why don't you help me call that name? Well, if you know that name, why don't you help me call that name? Well, if y'all don't mind today, let's call on a name above every other name. Let's call on that wonderful counselor. Let's call on that king of kings. Let's call on my peace that he provides. Let's call that name Jesus. Come on, call that name. Come on, call that name. Until they hear you on West Fuquay. Call that name. Until you feel it on the inside. Call that name. Until you feel better. Call that name. He's a wonder worker. He's my soul provider. How do you know his name? Because over 40 and two generations, the Lord sent his only begotten son so that he might die on an old rugged cross. And the Bible says when he died, he hung his head in the locks of his shoulder. How do you know he died? Because he stayed in a borrowed tomb all Friday. Stayed there all Saturday. Stayed there Saturday night. But the old saints would say, right early, Sunday morning, he got up with all power. Somebody shout all power. With all power in his hand. And how do you know he got all power? Because he saved my soul. How do you know he saved your soul? Because you showed up this morning with your mind fixed on Jesus. And you entered into his sanctuary to give him praise. How do you give him praise? I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus because he's worthy. How do you know he's worthy? Because he kept me all week long when I couldn't keep myself. And I showed up this morning to give the Lord some praise. Come on, high five your neighbor and say, neighbor, I thank God for the gathering place because I can worship God in spirit and in truth. Lift up your voice and give the Lord some praise. Find you one more neighbor and say, neighbor, aren't you glad that you made it to the house of worship? Give God some praise. Give him the fruit of your lips because he's worthy. I don't take for granted the gathering place.
We're going to praise the Lord tonight. Ah. 